All right, and we are live, and this is the Intersection Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Denick from Myovision, and I'm here with some very special guests. We are in Grapevine, Texas, I believe, which is a suburb of Dallas-Fort Worth, and we have a couple of great folks in what we're going to call the Blue Suede Room. Or these, Yeah, these are nice, aren't they? We have our fearless leader and CEO, Curtis McBride. We have a special guest here from TELUS, Daniel Klagerman. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. All right. Look at that. So let's get into this thing. So Daniel, we're all down here in Texas at ITSA, transportation, mobility, smart, um, industry, policymakers, government. Tell us a little bit about what you do for TELUS. It might have been like a double entendre. Uh, tell us what you do for TELUS and uh, share with the, you know, the audience at home uh, maybe why you're here. Absolutely. Yeah. So Really a pleasure to be here in Grapevine, uh, Texas. So for TELUS, I'm the director of Smart City and Public Safety. And what that really means is we are trying to figure out what solutions should we bring to market to make the outcomes better for everyone who uses uh, our cities, whether it's to work in our cities, to live in our cities, to play in our cities. Um, there are tons of opportunities in this space. I think anyone who's followed Smart City for many years knows that there's been a lot of talk a lot of attempts to drive better outcomes, but not so much progress. And we feel that we are, especially here with Myovision, at the uh, crux and at the, the pinnacle of this moment where there is a huge opportunity to start to, to drive better outcomes. So it's really my job to figure out how all that's going to come together with all of the uh, thousands of smart people that stand behind me. And uh, we really feel optimistic that, that now is the time to improve safety, to improve uh, carbon emissions, to reduce congestion and, and all that good stuff. Nice. So actually, Curtis and I were chatting about this just before as we're kind of like almost a half day or three quarters of a day. And it does feel a little bit different, Curtis, to the fact, you know, to the, has it moved past the point of it being about talk into the momentum being where it needs to be and the intent being where, where it needs to be from your, from your perspective, just the first day? Yeah, I mean, it, it seems like it. Like I remember um, uh, years ago, the first uh, ITS America that uh, uh, Regina Hopper, who was the, the for former CEO of ITSA, uh, was at. She got up on stage, talked about technology, innovation, disruption, um, and got a lot of flack from some of the incumbent vendors that were like, whoa, 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 we don't want things to change. Like, what are you talking about? Um, but the the session this morning, I mean, 200 people in the room, uh, the whole conversations about digital digital infrastructure, uh, the need for data exchange protocols, governance uh, around it, standard new standards. Um, so yeah, it se it seems like it seems like the 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 environment has uh, caught up to the to the need for rethinking how we do things. Yeah, great. And you know, you you kind of listed off a couple items, Daniel, as far as like what your your personal motivation as well as you know the support of Talus in this space, but you know, it, it's not lost to me that you guys are what would look like a telecommunications company. So why, why this focus for TELUS? Like, why is this really important for you? Is it a Canadian only thing? Is it a global thing? Maybe just reinforce some of the, the details that might not seem so obvious to folks at home. Yeah, absolutely. So I think it's important to realize that uh, TELUS is a different kind of telco. And uh, it's not just something that we say, it's something that we've proven. Uh, for example, TELUS has a business unit called TELUS Health, and that's really about driving better health outcomes for Canadians. Uh, we are the largest healthcare IT firm in Canada. Uh, we've done that through a variety of means, acquisitions and partnerships, and really bringing together all the right players in that space to make a big difference. And that's one of several examples. We have a, an agriculture business as another example. So I think it's, you know, we're, we're yes, uh, a telco that builds and, and invests significantly into 5G and, and connectivity and all the traditional services that you might be familiar with. But for us, that's only the beginning. Um, ultimately, our social purpose is what we care about. We're trying to drive better outcomes, do well while we do good uh, in the world. And we feel that transportation and traffic in particular, as Curtis has mentioned, is, is just ripe for digital transformation and not just for its own sake, right? This is not just about technology. This is about actually the, the road users who are vulnerable today. And, uh, you know, unfortunately still fatalities are going up despite all the vision zero targets. Uh, we're not heading in the right direction, but we feel that we could be. So it's something we care deeply about and we feel we have the right assets, including the technology and the connectivity, but, but more so uh, the ability to bring together the right players and uh, build a model that will really make a difference. Cool. Yeah, I, I agree. And Curtis, we, you know, when you think about, I, I, 
maybe I'm the, can I be the pessimist in the room? Are we five years from being five years away or are we 10 years from being 10 years away? Like, you, you know, we talk about specification, you, you kind of reference this analog that you talk about all the time, which is like the Spotify cassette specification. Like how close are we, do, do you believe, to that ready now moment for the industry to kind of like really transform? I think it's, I think it's, I think it's here. Um, you know, changing the built form takes time, right? Uh, so, so it'll take time for the change to spread out um, and be, you know, be felt as you drive around in a city. Um, but I, I, I think there's a lot of like macro trends, you know, tr tr traditionally this in industry has been somewhat insular. Uh, we've been sort of, we, we, we focus on each other incumbents, you know, competing with incumbents. Um, but whether you, whether you look at, you know, 5G as a, as a trend line, um, you know, artificial intelligence, uh, the autom all the automation that's going to flow from, from that, you know, even things like uh, supply chain constraints and inflation, which has put stress on these like 25 year old architectures that we, we have built up around. Um, yeah, I, I think, I think the macro uh, forces are now putting pressure on this industry to change. And, you know, as we always say, like, you know, change is either going to happen to you or through you, uh, I think there's a there's a there's a moment for our industry to decide: do we want it to, to just happen to us, right? And that change comes in and pushes us all out of the way, or do we want to get organized and uh, you know come come up with a renewed vision of what this industry could be and be the catalyst for the change? Okay, that's awesome. So Daniel, when you're not on podcasts here in uh, Grapevine, Texas, what are you what are you up to? What do you what kind of keeps you busy? Yeah, so I've got, uh, believe it or not, lots of interests uh, outside of work as well. I'm, I'm an avid squash player and uh, not to be confused with racquetball. So it's not the big blue ball. It's a small black ball that or doesn't pickle, bounce. Definitely not pickleball. No okay. no offense oh. to the pickleball players. It's Hater it's okay. Hater it's okay. of the pickleball. <laughs> wow. But no, I do, uh, for me, squash is a huge stress relief. I get on the court, believe it or not, five or six days a week. Wow. And uh, what, it's what allows me to get back to all this uh, important work for 10 to 12 hours at a time. Uh, in the warmer months, you know, because I do live in Toronto, so unfortunately for six months, a little bit hard to get out on your bicycle, but I do love to cycle around the city. And I also have two teenage children, so that's always an adventure. Yeah, that's awesome. So, you know, teenage children, um, I'm assuming they're loyal TELUS handheld subscribers. Yes. And they love power and 5G. So spell it out for me, who's maybe not the experienced uh, technologist in the room. I'll be, you know, maybe I can admit that. What is 5G and why is it important for, you know, teenagers, but also like smart cities and smart mobility? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, uh, it's actually not a dumb question. It's a really important question. Um, I think a lot of us see the marketing around 5G and all we think about is, can I get my uh, YouTube video or, or Snapchat even faster? And I think what you're getting at is, that's not really necessary. That, that is pretty much fast enough. Now there's always room for improvement. Um, I think the most important thing for me about 5G and this space is this is where we actually need the faster speeds, but even more so the lower latencies. Um, so we can get the data from point A to point B uh, more quickly, but also with less latency. So it's getting there at the time that we actually need it. And the other really important thing about 5G that we don't often talk about is something called multi-access edge compute. I know it's a mouthful. Uh, we shorten it to MEC. And essentially what that means is we can process data in real time very close to where you collect that data. So for example, a MyoVision camera in an intersection that's collecting video, um, Mac will allow us and 5G will allow us to process that video quickly enough to send real-time alerts to people in the future and uh, start to achieve Vision Zero targets. Right. So, What does that really mean then? That means like car A is moving towards intersection MyoVision, maybe not paying attention, another car is speeding towards an intersection, and low latency, no latency, notifiers, warnings are signaled or sent. Yes. And people are saved. Exactly. So you're you're hitting on why we're so excited about uh, our role in transforming the world of traffic. It is fundamentally a connectivity problem, right? We have road users when it comes to vehicles, pedestrians, cyclists. We have all the intersections and the traffic lights. We have all these data points. How do we bring them all together with low enough latency so that we can actually send real-time alerts? That's there's another protocol just to give you another acronym called CV2X and the the V is the vehicle and the X is everything else right could be a pedestrian could be the network itself could be an intersection um, we feel that 5G is the way to connect all these things together in a way that we can actually improve safety reduce emissions 
reduce congestion. Very cool. Just to, to bring it even even to the um, you know to the end customer perspective. So um, you know we we often will talk about like how do we accelerate uh, the the time to impact right like the time to scale. So you're a city of uh, 500 intersections. It might take you several years of capital budget to to install the you know let's face it expensive hardware that goes into you know providing um uh you know safety alerting detection counts the data that you need to optimize your city uh the promise with 5g is that you know instead of putting a you know expensive gpu with an expensive heat sink and you know having to design this whole piece of hardware you know, to put in to be able to process video all of a sudden you can process the video in uh, in in the, in the cloud in the mech uh that device becomes you know half the cost a quarter of the cost uh, so now you can deploy at scale way faster than you could have in in the current paradigm. Um, so uh, that's the thing that I think, as as my vision, the thing we're really excited about about, about 5G is it's just going to enable cities to deploy this stuff, um, this transformational uh, capability into their cities at, in like you know a fraction of the time. Right. And this is, if I could add, this is why we have made and continue to make these investments in 5G. It's exactly for use cases like this, right, where the unit economics are not going to work if you have to do each one on its own. Uh, but part of the digital transformation of the entire traffic network is transforming it into the network that we have, the modern network, right? 5G and, and Mac and cloud. These tools are already available. I think all the technology we need to achieve these outcomes is available. We've just got to put them all together. Love it. Very visual. Um, so we're collecting data, cell phones are moving, cars are moving. There's some folks notionally that believe that might not be good, uh, that they're worried about privacy and what happens with their information or, so how, what are some of the protections or answers that you might give somebody that's a little bit worried about that? Yeah, I think, I think the first thing I'll say is we're worried about that too. Um, it's actually something we spend a lot of time on. Uh, privacy is extremely important to us. Uh, we have a very sophisticated privacy uh, process before we can launch any solution. It's a huge pain and it, and it should be, right? There are a lot of uh, steps that you need to go through to ensure that people's privacy is protected. There is always some kind of trade-off between uh, the outcomes that you want to get and your privacy, but there's a line that you cannot cross, right? And we've seen examples in the past in the world of smart city where those lines have not been respected and it just does not work out. So TELUS follows uh, privacy by design as our core principle, which means from the start of the design of any new solution, including in traffic, uh, we have to build privacy in from the beginning. And look, there are some things that would be amazing to do in terms of outcome, but we would have to sacrifice uh, privacy and we just won't do that. So we'll have to find another way. I, I, I think what, one of the things uh, people talk about data is the new oil, right? And I think the way that that's often been interpreted as like data as an asset, data data is, a, is valuable. But just like with oil, uh, you know, environmental protections, how you transport oil, how you sort of, there, there's a whole social license around treating oil responsibly in order to enable it to be a valuable asset. I think data, data is no different, right? Like you need to marry the, the notion of social license and the value of data they're not two opposing things. They're like two sides of the same coin. Uh, one unlocks the other. Uh, and and I think, yeah, I mean, one of the reasons we were really excited to partner with TELUS is I think they they have a similar you know, view, uh, even going back to some of the work we've done, you know, if you remember back to the Civic, Civic Digital Network we did together, uh, it's been sort of a shared value of the, of the two companies. All right, well, that's great. Thanks um, to both of you. Why don't we agree, maybe in the next few months, we'll check in again uh, on not only the relationship, but you know, maybe this point in time at this conference is a, a bit of a watershed moment. So thanks to Curtis, thanks to Daniel and the team from TELUS for your support. And we'll catch you both uh, very soon. Bye for now.